How's it going, everybody? Uh, I, uh, Darren, I, I've skipped some protocol here, so I'm not going to queue over to you. You see, everybody see Darren over there. Uh, my name's Jacob Campbell. I run the Liegeverse Facebook page, and I want to thank you so much for stopping by today. This is a really fun and exciting uh, event we're going to get to have for you. You may have seen some of the uh, interviews we posted in the past. Those are definitely labors of love of mine, uh, but these are a little bit easier to do, easier to get people on board and talk, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a lot more of this kind of stuff with all of you guys. So uh, this is Darren John Ashmore. Darren, how are you doing? I'm very well. Yourself? I'm excellent. I'm super stoked to have you on board and to get to really pick your mind. I mean, we were just talking for for no more than five or ten minutes before this. And and I swear it was <laughs> I had to stop it because there was too much, too much good stuff being said between. I want to share it with everybody. So and if you're here, if you're in the comments section, please feel free to post any questions that you have for Darren. He is one of our most qualified Liegeverse experts that we've ever had on the show. So please take advantage of this opportunity to pick this man's brain and also take a chance to pre-order the new book, Leiji Matsumoto Essays on the Manga and Anime Legend. It is the first of its kind in English and it's so important that People like Darren have worked on this to document uh, Matsumoto's work. So, again, thank you. Um, Darren, let's just start out here and uh, I'm going to wean us off the music. Uh, Darren, what do you do for a living? How do you contribute to the Liege Vert? Well, I suppose it's, it's my work as an anthropologist and a historian, though between positions at the moment, as much as a writer or anything else. Mm. And uh, what introduced you to anime and more specifically Leiji Matsumoto? Have you got a good few hours? That's a long. <laughs> you could oh. paraphrase it, cut it down. You're an editor, right? <laughs> the short answer then it starts with the BBC in the 70s buying in a number of either Americanized series like Marine Boy, Battle of the Planet, and Robotech, as well as things like The Mysterious Cities of Gold. But more specifically, it relates to the way in which, through happenstance and accident, a number of fans in England came together at the end of the 80s under the banner of Helen McCarthy's Anime UK fanzine and the work, the much ignored work of a little shop called the Sheffield Space Centre in my hometown, whose owner was perhaps the most interesting person and one of the first commercial individuals to recognise the potential in importing and selling anime-related goods. The people who met in that shop shared material, bought merchandise and organized parties and then conventions, helped hammer the first nail into British fandom, which then connected us to American fandom, which was already very well established, and finally out into Japan itself. That's awesome. So you guys had like a little uh, pressure cooker inside of this tiny shop and it just exploded all over the face of Great Britain is basically what you're saying here. Seriously, the, yeah. the owner of that shop was incredibly foresighted and very supportive of the fan groups themselves, even sponsoring Britain's first, well, not the not first, Helen would probably take exception to that, but... <laughs> a local one-day convention which spawned a number of offshoots and helped develop the scene properly in the early 90s. That's awesome. So that was your anime introduction, your anime indoctrination, but let's get into the Liegeverse. How did you first find uh, the works of Matsumoto? 
a friend gave me a copy of a rather badly hacked up version of Arcadia of my youth, which led me to seeking out the, the first full version, which may have been on Animego Laserdisc back in, what, 93, 94. And that hooked me. From there, when in Japan for the first, first study in 94, I was able to go to a fan meet because Matsumoto Sensei has always been very well connected with his fans. And that's when I discovered 3.9 and all his other works and fell in love with what I still consider to be his operatic, even Wagnerian approach to cyclic storytelling and those elfin characters like the ones behind me that have dominated his aesthetic since he first started working on girls comics in the 60s yeah um it's it's so it's like quicksand you know you just touch one and love it and you'll just dive so hard in every other work that he's done and and the theming and and his ability to cycle like you said really does it is sort of the vortex that that pulls you in to that to that life and and why i've spent over six months building this page for nothing else than just, wow, I'm so enthusiastic about this. Um, so you are currently in Japan, yes? Yes. So what is life like for uh, a Lieji Matsumoto fan in Japan? It's hard than you'd imagine, but it's more rewarding as well. Matsumoto has never, never been one of the figures that crested, as it were, in the same way as a Miyazaki. He's had his dedicated fans from the start, but eschewed the idea of being a superstar creator. So today, with the old man, like it or not, coming to the end of his career and building a legacy for himself, you go to fan events and it's a few dozen people, very dedicated, old and young. It's not, how can I put it? The, the country is not awash with merchandise and new series and a great effusion for the man. But there's always something there. And the master always keeps himself very connected. So it is possible to see and buy and experience the Lagiverse, but you've got to go looking for it and you've got to know what you want. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it sounds true. It, it sounds true that it, it may be, it, you know, America, Japan, Great Britain, wherever you are, whatever's pop, whatever's most popular is going to dominate the cultural landscape. I mean, I think that's kind of what you're saying is that Matsumoto isn't on that pop forefront in Japan. Um, and, and you maybe have to dig for it in some ways, but then you get rewarded with with boat rides and train rides, literal infrastructure built around his creations. I mean, that that reward is definitely higher than anywhere else in the world. So so that sounds about right. To me, it's almost as if and I speak as a fan, therefore take this with a pinch of salt. Almost as if his name is so ubiquitous that few people think about it. They know mm. the work, but they don't necessarily know the connections. It, it's like, sort of like air, you know, you're, you're not conscious you're breathing all the time, but it keeps you alive. <laughs> it's, it's what it what it's what moves things forward, you know, and there's so much of, of Matsumoto's DNA in, in Japan after something like Yamato, I'd assume that that's hard to avoid doing to like infusing your humanity with the culture to a point where it's not even a, a, an active thing that we think about anymore. You know, it, we have any sci-fi in America is going to be compared to George Lucas, and we're going to be talking about George Lucas. But 
I don't think we have that. You, you probably don't have that so much in Japan. It maybe is just like air. I don't know. But uh, we'll, we'll, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, carry on, carry on. Yeah, uh, so you know Matsumoto, correct? You're, you're, you're on sort of a, maybe not a first name basis with the man, but I, I, can you tell me what, how you met him, you know, how your relationship works? I am a constant thorn in his side. Yes. <laughs> you might, I, I suppose I'm on eye rolling association with him because every time I send something, his eyes roll. No, 94, that's when I first met him. Every year until quite recently, he's run a number of fan meetings, little gatherings for his fan club members, and he's very open with, with people when they go to them. It's a good way to get, or it was a good way to get into the mind of his personality, to hear more about his family and his history. And the first time I went, apart from a couple of French fans who were there, I was the only representative of the Anglophone world. And he found it interesting because he was pleased and a little disappointed at, because of after what had happened to Captain Harlock and Queen Millennia when they were sort of mushed together. Ruined, yes. Disrespected. I'll say those words. <laughs> well, I'll... Uh, and since then, from 94 onwards, I visited as many events as I could. 96, then again in 98, 99. For two years when I was doing my doctorate, I'd turn up whenever. And once I came back to Japan permanently in 2007, I visited every single one. So it was just a question of being the same bad penny that turned up meet after meet after meet. And he was always interested, not only in what I thought about his works, but what my life was like and mm. the, the lives of other non-Japanese fans who came to the events as well. Curious. Mm. He was especially amused, in fact, that by the fact that he also met and still remembers a friend of mine, a chap called Rick, who worked at the Space Center. In 90, he went to, uh, Matsumoto went to the Festival at Anglen, the great comics convention in France, and met this rather excitable young chap <laughs> from England mm -hmm. whilst he was on this sort of tour around France and Germany looking for sites related to the actress, Mar actress Marianne Hall. And then okay. after so many years to come back to find that little connection between those two people, and that made him giggle. Talking the what? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's that's everything in the lazy verse. And, and it's not. Yeah, it's it's really not just in the work. It's in the people surrounding the work. I mean, I've spoken with too many of you guys not to believe in in some sort of destiny here i mean we and perhaps we're all creating our own destiny and and it does sort of work like that it's uh you, you gotta put up your fair share to make destiny work but i i can imagine that that wise laugh coming coming from his his lips there that that sounds great um but after so, that though after yeah. that since then i think Oh, what's the word? His point of view on everything he's done, almost since the very beginning, has been predicated not just on his peers and certainly his association with people like Nishizaki, whether that was Troubled or not, or Tezuka or Chiba Tetsuya, but also on his relationships with all his fans have in some way guided his work. Yeah, I mean, uh, human or animal. It's, it's, it's not, it's all life. It's, it's everything for him. And I, and I really love that holistic approach to, to kind of viewing it. Um, 
And and I hope he, you know, you you say his career will come to an end. I, I'm I'm cheering for the guy's brain to get in that robot body. I, I know that's that's we're it's we we're on a race right now. I've I could it's like the horses are neck and neck, I almost feel like. But that we'll we'll get more Matsumoto stories forever. Um or, or maybe even we'll program his his brain into a AI, you know. It's it's all that but that's science fantasy and Maybe maybe I'm just a believer in that way. Um. He's addressed, of course. He's been thinking about the transhuman I, uh, ideal since, well, since the late sixties, in some fashion or another. All of Galaxy Express, you know, that's and, and before that, Sexeroid and. Mm. See, so you're more abreast of the the depth of that idea. You know, I, I don't get to read Sexeroid. I'm assuming you speak Japanese. Oh, yes. Yes, so I, I haven't taken that plunge yet. You'll have to tell me more about that idea. Yes, please, please go on. Specifically on the transhuman issue, mm -hmm. it seems to be a bit of a 50-50 for him. As you can mm -hmm. imagine from Galaxy Express, he definitely comes down on the side of the, the moment you put even a small amount of humanity into a machine you lose the humanity now this this is something that Odintado hits us over the head with in the three galaxy express films but in the manga it's a lot more subtle there are characters who are machine and yet what's the word pathetic in the philosophical sense mm -hmm. like unlike shadow the the wraith of pluto or like, well, even Count Mecca is made to seem pathetic at at the end yes. of his of his life. Almost as if by giving up their flesh, they have become a greater slave to the same things that humans are victims to. The need to consume and the need to exist. Energy replaced by food. There is perhaps the, the greatest quote comes from came from one of his public speak uh, one of his public events though it is noted in much of the lady verse that the the instant we give in to this desire to be eternal we lose the very thing that makes us special as creations or evolved objects there is no true immortality because the moment we take that leap into the artificial, everything worth preserving is lost. Yes, That's there's, uh, the point behind sexeroid particularly. Yeah, I mean, there's that, that constant theme of the, the cost of freedom and, and freedom being what, in Matsumoto's mind, seems to be what validates life. The cost of that freedom is our inevitable death and, and doom and end. And uh, but that end is not an end. And it all goes from there. It circles around and around. Um, let, let's talk about. Uh, let's talk about the, your process. OK, you you've created helped to create this book. Beiji Matsumoto essays on the manga and anime legend. Pre-order that book. Go check it out in our description. Uh, first of its kind in English. You you've done so much here to break barriers for the Liege verse, and namely the the English barrier that seems to be there. The the barrier that that you know publishers have mishandled, misused the works, and and we don't get it. And it's so important what you're doing. Can you take me through the process? of creating that book and what it was like for you? It was a series of accidents. It started out with an idea at a, a Matsumoto party in 2014, just a little pub in Tokyo with a few people sitting around. And some, some wit in the crowd just asked, the sensei during the Q&A session. Have you, you know, has, has your biography appeared in any other language? And his response, no, not even in French. 
And of course, he's very fond of the French market because I think the, the French version of Harlock is as respectful to the material as anyone has ever produced, the Albator version. Still, of course, I know people will take that with its own particular grain, but that did introduce the European market to the Ladyverse in, in a real sense. And he said, and even so, I don't think I'd want just a biography. There are loads of those in Japanese and they're pretty pedestrian. What I'd like is for someone to listen to me. And I thought, well, okay. The, the university I worked for at the time, uh, Yamanashi Gakuin University, was willing to support it in a way. And the idea of the biography evolved into an ethnography, which required more than one voice. Thankfully, Helen was willing to join, and through her, we were able to hook into the minds and voices of some very capable long-time scholars and new scholars who were fans of the Ladyverse in one point or another. Tim and Zach, Stephanie and Ed, John, Helen herself, Ondine and Matthew, each one with their own particular take. The importance for this book when chatting with the creators and Helen was to make sure that it was not just a simple curry, you know, chronological dive through Matsumoto Sensei's life, but a particular take on various elements. So each creator was left to their own devices, perhaps with a, a general question, but we found that letting them run in their own area. Tim with art, Zach with language, Stephanie with gender, Helen, the, biogra the biography, and myself on the meaning and the metaphor, as well as everyone else's. And from there, the accident brought us we were to where we are. But it is all built on the cooperation and the What's the word? The goodwill of the master himself. Because the book is built on a number of interviews, one of which appears in the book itself. Yeah, it, it sounds like you guys basically, you know, modeled this this effort, this co collaborative effort around the crewmate structure of the Arcadia. It's it's everybody is is trusted by the captains to do that good work. And, and perhaps Matsumoto's the captain here. You know, it's it wouldn't wouldn't surprise me if, if that's the best way to summarize the metaphor I'm going for. Sounds like you guys all really respected one another and, and maybe more so than goodwill, respect being the core of the ethos there. That 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 sounds fantastic. It's uh, that's truly the case. It started as my book. Then Helen got on board, and Tim, and Zach, and Ondine, and the others, and it became our book. By the time we finished, we realized that it was his book. It's not how books. little, how little he has to do to make something distinctly Matsumoto. Oh, that's his genius. Yes. Something that Tim pointed out in his interview with you, and that a lot of people don't quite understand, is that though. It's often assumed that when Matsumoto was hired as a, a story consultant and an art consultant for Yamato, he didn't do as much as people think he did on the animation. But he provided an undoubted baseline for everyone in writing, in art and direction. He provided what Tim might call an element of the Cosmo DNA. Didn't have to do a great deal. And it's been the same with a lot of his work. When I've looked through his more modern corpus, I've realized that just like Monkey Punch with Lupin, the Matsumoto Sensei himself has not done as much as you might think. 
The animation for his series was handled by his friend Rintaro, at least in directing sense. The same with his films and going down into the OAVs and the more recent works, they've all been taken up by former students, protégés, friends, people who have come to love and understand this aesthetic, but have altered it to fit with their own particular ideals and with the support of Matsumoto Sensei himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Tim did mention that that's a direct conflict to uh, an artist like uh, Miyazaki, who is very, very controlling and, and more apt to take work away and do it himself rather than Matsumoto, who uh, everything I've read about his experience with Yamato, he he was a, a great teacher. And, and there's almost... Uh, he himself believed him. He believed himself to be too old. By the time he got to anime, he was too old to make massive influence in that space. But I'm not really sure if that has to do with his ability to teach and revolutionize the art form as much as maybe his resistance to get too deep into the kind of corporate mechanizations of what you know, TV broadcasting brings with it. Uh, you know, how do you feel about his take on sort of gone rogue? And I would say that applies to his relationship to the industry as well. What do you think about that? I would draw, I would draw this back to the time he was making the leap from a young comic artist into the mainstream. He was working in the early 60s on a comic called Mary of the Silver Valley. Now, this was meant to be just an ordinary girl's adventure. But speaking to his wife, Maki Miyako, who was an influence on him, he realized there was more to be gained by subverting the, the idea of the comic and turned it very successfully into an almost science fiction adventure. But having come out of that and opened the way into a more boys-oriented science fiction environment, he began to see that, at least according to an interview I did with him, that there was something better in a collaborative approach to this particular form of communication than, what's the word, taking control. He found that working with others like his wife, like with Tezuka, when they would all crowd around one projector and work on everyone else's material through long nights than being a patriarchal controlling figure. I think he just was raised during the first generation of mangaka and was raised with what can only be called a group sense of work aesthetic. He's always happy to work with others. He's he's got a great touch for it, you know. He's got a great touch for collaboration to to lead without, um, you know, without an iron fist. He, he leads by by ethic, and and you see that in somebody like Captain Harlock. Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, Matsumoto can be as stern. Well, I, I think he can be as stern as Harlock though when he's leading a ship. He's not afraid to make hard yeses and hard noes. And that, to me, says that he, he's willing to collaborate, but he's also a man of values and principles and, and knows when to maybe walk away or, or disconnect. I mean, I see that happening in, in his experience with Yamato, where he basically washed his hands of the whole thing leading towards the end. Well, it's not for me to say whether that was right or wrong. The courts have already spoken in 1999. But it is true, he is a man of conviction. And especially now, as he is attempting to put what can only be called 
the final touches on his legacy in preparation for the inevitable. He's be, he is once again working with other creators to ensure that what passes into the post-Matsumoto world retains the vitality that it has had for the last 50 odd years. And I think he's doing doing a fine job with artists like Jerome Alquier uh, and uh, I should I, I need to look this up every time I do an interview. But uh, the the Japanese Harlock manga artists, uh, it's it's Boshi Boshi. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, doing such a great job to allow them freedom to express themselves, to revolutionize the style, however much I'll, you know, forever lament the absence of the loose brush. Uh, technique on on Captain Harlock. I, regardless of that, I, I'm still happy that he's willing to let it be adapted and, and reformed, and he's leading those efforts and not being uh, an obstructionist to those efforts. And, and maybe he's even being a little too free with it sometimes. I mean, things have happened where uh, people people sort of put forth a live action Captain Harlock Kickstarter that gets no funding or, uh, you know, some, something along those lines, trying to do that subversion and then it kind of backfiring. And that's just kind of the risk. Um, but you know, well, how do you feel about that? Yeah. For me, I have no problem with it. If a thing has merit, it will stand. And for Matsumoto Sensei, the same is likewise. I, distance myself from the Japanese arguments here that suggest this is being done purely as a series of cash grabs, because this is always the way in which the, the, thing, we, the thing we now call the Lejiverse has existed. Ever since Mirai Zaban, the comic little time traveling series was stitched into the overall storyline of Harlock and Emeraldas and then Galaxy Express. Matsumoto himself has been inventing and reinventing the same characters to explore particular ideas. Time and again, people have asked him, which is the correct timeline? And time and again, he's always said, well, there isn't one, or there is, perhaps, but it changes. He does not seem to have any given major problem with creators toying with what has been written, which has been produced, because he's already done it so many times himself. I mean, you Americans, go ahead. You can't tell an interesting tale if you're not able to make full use of the characters at a laid down, and that means change. I mean, what? Do you think there's a difference in how Marvel branded their universe and how Leiji Matsumoto branded his universe? I mean, is it a cultural difference that we just buy into this idea and we're OK with it? This idea that characters can exist in different forms and, and they may even be part of the same thing. They may all all the Supermans, all the, you know, X-Mans <laughs> may get together and fight. Uh, but that's not. Oh, it's why. Why is there so much resistance to that idea with the Leiji verse? difference? It's almost as if there can only be one figure at a time. To have multiple versions come together would, would somehow, I think, undermine the mythic qualities of the character. The nearest we got was Matsumoto creating a story in which two Harlocks would meet, but ultimately that turned into just a, a renovation of the Arcadia of my youth timeline to introduce the character Great Harlock as a, how can I put it, a more bleak-minded, militaristic, vengeful figure who would be the father figure to our Harlock. Other than that, I think a true multiverse just would not work. Lagi the Lagiverse is a series of cycles mm -hmm. in which the same character will repeat through different timelines, but never quite crossing themselves. 
I like it that way. Right. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if that particularly is the reason why, you know, Marvel Universe, OK, Liegeverse, weird. I, I don't know. Uh, are these all these rules seem arbitrary anyways? It's just creative work. So I'll buy it hook, line and sinker, sinker if I'm having a good time. And he's always giving me a good time. He's always inspiring me with his stories. So uh, the story to me matters there. Uh, it, Hypothesis. With the Marvel situation, there was always an explanation. And perhaps... perhaps and that's like the fiction, like sci-fiction versus sci-fantasy sort of yeah. difference there. I think we seek an explanation to justify these, these happenings around us, no matter how fantastical they may be. But in the case of Matsumoto, we don't get explanations. We do not know even now why the Lagiverse exists canonically within itself, how characters are connected to each other, why the different series are still operating within one continuum, if not on the same timeline. These things have never been addressed. And as you will discover in the book, they never will be. For reasons which I don't know, because the man himself wouldn't tell me. <laughs> so, so we don't know everything yet. Uh, but maybe he's still holding out on a few mysteries for us. So time will tell. Um, I'd like to ask you another question, though, and kind of move forward, because uh, beyond this book, you've also done a documentary on Matsumoto in Japan, in, in Japanese. And could you tell me a little bit more about. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about your involvement in that and how that came to be? I was just, I was on the sidelines, really just holding a card saying, yeah, yeah, you go. <laughs> it was a fan-based project, uh, a crowdfunded project. And even though it didn't quite meet its goal three, four years ago, the group that carried, you know, funded it, sold it off to SCAPA, Sky Broadcasting in Japan. And it was a way to, to put out a brief introduction to Matsumoto's biography and connect with some of his old friends like Chiba Tetsuya and act as something of a, a tourist attraction to his old home in Fukuoka. And that's primarily where it was, was intended to draw people to. So although it was broadcast as a, a regional tourist bump, it has gained some popularity on Blu-ray with fans as a, a way of getting a few insights into the master's life as a child, his time during the war. And hopefully we'll see inclusion on one of the American releases upcoming. Uh, there were no promises there. All I did in the, the production was to take down subtitle notes for a, a potential US version, which has not yet happened, and throw money at the project. Well, money never hurts. Uh, you know, I, we appreciate that work. And you, you've all heard it now. Uh, there's a subtitled, ready to go documentary on the man himself that we're not getting. Uh, who should yes. fans complain to about that? Uh, <laughs> Funimation or whoever holds the current US rights, just we need that whoever yeah. with Scapa Japan and ask for it. Scapa Japan. OK, OK, well, I'll look more into that. Um, you know, as somebody who would love to do something like a fan documentary, I we've talked about this before, so I'm going to get a little selfish here. Talk about what I want to do. Um, you know, I'd love to talk about Matsumoto, you know, it's like it's like this legendary status, this man who's contributed so much, made an indelible mark on an art form that is exploding in the States. Absolutely unprecedented uh, growth for the anime market. And we don't know anything about him. You know, most people who enjoy anime regularly know who Tezuka is, know what Astro Boy is. Captain Harlock just seems like this faraway figure that's 
way more confusing to us. And it's probably just because we didn't get it. But I'd love to talk more about that. And, and what, what were the barriers getting to us? You know, uh, you, you touched a little bit on Harmony Gold. I, I'm somewhat familiar with that stuff. But could you explain for everybody sort of what that uh, process was like? the early 80s and even till today where we're lucky we're getting uh, su uh submarine super 99 march 30th which is my birthday that's an amazing birthday present so we've come a long way since then but but what was it like back then in the 70s and the 80s especially in america the market for cheap television was quite broad as networks began to expand Remembering, of course, that the idea of 24-hour television did not exist then. But as the broadcast slots opened up, national and local networks in the States and, of course, in Europe needed cheap programming. The idea of importing already completed programs and either editing them together, dubbing them, it appealed because it was a lot simpler than cooking up their own stuff. Now, America had led the way in this during the great boom of the 60s, when I believe Atom was first broadcast in the US, then led on with, what's the word? Live action series like Journey to the West and The Magic Monkey. And finally to the one series, I think that snapped to the spine and showed and the entirety of America, what could be done? And that, of course, is Star Blazers. The problem was that in order to get into syndication, meaning that the series could be sold around regional TV networks and repeated, a certain number of episodes would be required of a series. I think the number at the time was somewhere between 65 or, no, was it 88? I th I've... <sighs> For the uh, Harlock animes, the situation was they needed 75, I think, or 60, I think 65, because there were 40 some episodes of the original and 24 of SSX, and they were even shy having both of those, and that's why they did Queen Millennium. And that's where the problem started. By chopping out the heart of one of the series, they ended up creating something so bad. I don't think it was broadcast more than once. And I don't think it's, even now, I don't think it's available for home release. No, I think uh, <laughs> maybe Malibu put it out or something at some point, but that that was not good. Not a good but time. It's not just Harmony Gold who did this. And whether or not you like Harlock and the Queen of a Thousand Years or Robotech, the same thing was done to Gatchaman in a in a more brutalistic fashion because although you know they there was the requisite number of episodes were there. In fact, too many were there. And so they were hacked down, stitched together to remove elements of violence. Animation was added in to cover up the missing parts, and something which in hindsight is nothing better than dog rope. But has a better than what? Dog rope. Dog rope is that is that colloquial? Oh, colloquial English. Uh, bit yes, of a yes. mess. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 over my head. Go on, please. At the time, it was fantastic. In hindsight, mind you, hindsight is perfect, and I would rather have things that way because it opened up the world to what might follow. So it was, yes, it was much harder to get uncut material into the English markets in the 70s and 80s. But once that had been changed by, I think it was the Mysterious Cities of Gold, 86, 87, the Japanese French co-production, the market began to see what was possible. It's another series that people don't recognize today, though it was pivotal at the time it was created. 
Um, so you are by trade, what I understand, uh, anthropologist. Yes. And that gives you such fantastic insight into things like iconography and, uh, you know, sort of these these myths, these myths, these tales that we tell each other uh, as humans that go down and evolve through time. And I was just wondering if you could spread a little light on what is the iconography of something in the Liege verse? Like, let, let's start out simple. Uh, let's talk about Captain Harlock. He's got uh, an eye patch. He's he's lost his sight in his left eye, I believe. Um, and he's you know he's rocking this pirate garb, but but there are there are a lot of like little ancient uh implications in his iconography could you talk a little bit about harlock well let's start with the obvious one he's a pirate sure. the cue jack sparrow the idea the concept of the pirate and privateer going back to the a the golden age of piracy 17th and 18th century is a very strange and almost disturbing sense of mythicism of the monster. On the one hand, the pirate is a murderer and a thief, and yet we tend to lord them. We put them up on a pedestal because they represent freedom. Now, this is especially true for the people who lived at the time. 18th century Europe was not a very, well, Oh, it was a libertine place, but it wasn't a very libertarian place. Countries were brutal. Times were hard. You lived and died at the, the whim of a very small number of people. Those who broke away from the norm and were able to live lives, no matter how brutal and no matter how short, under their own flag, beholden to none, it was easy to see them as heroes because for the most part, people did not fall under their depredations. The pirate, in other words, represents something of a mythic duality, representing transience in life, but absolute liberty within it. And then beyond that, each of the elements that he possesses, the eye patch, is a very interesting one. Though it tends to be represented as loss, a lack of vision, tied back perhaps to mythic figures like Odin, who gave up one of his eyes for greater knowledge. The truth of it, if there is a truth, is that pirates wore patches to maintain their night vision. So you would wear a patch on one eye, board a ship, fight your way below decks, and then switch the patch to the other eye, and your the eye would already be ac accustomed to lower light and would give you a better fighting chance below decks. Whether that's absolutely true is up for debate. But yet It's interesting that they would value a, a bit um, faster like uh, adaptation to depth perception. Now, that, that, of course, is just a hypothesis, but it's one yeah. that has a, a reasonable amount of support in the histories. But whether or not it is a fighting, uh, what's the word, a method of fighting, or whether it does represent the loss of an eye, it's one of those great symbols of piracy. The pirate has an eye patch and a hooked hand and a peg leg. Those things go with it. But more important is the scar. And this one ties back to Matsumoto Sensei's fondness for Germanic myth. Harlock is not just a pirate, he is a Germanic pirate. His home is in the great man of Hellingestad. He is a Bavarian noble, and the scar represents pride. A classic dueling scar, which up until the 20th century, many upper class and noble Germans, Prussians, Bavarians, call them what you will, would wish to have 
taken on the end of a schlager at a formal dueling score, if you're familiar with German-style sabre dueling. Personally, no, but uh, it's interesting to hear that, that, that there's a connection there. Um, and, and it is, my brain, I was thinking of, you know, he, he's got a home, he's got an estate in Arcadia. You, you're referring to the, the Arcadia of my youth, World War II Hardlock, I'm assuming. Um, he's, he's got an estate in Arcadia, which is Greek, right? That's, that's Athens? Well, or is that actually a different Arcadia that he's referring to? For for the Harlock family as a whole, going back into the ancient line of the family, when they were nothing more than robber barons on the, the fringes of Europe, Hellingestad, if I'm saying it correctly, my German's not good, is his Arcadia. The Greek Arcadia, the, the small mountain city-state, which became the model for this Hellenistic paradise, somewhere between the Elysian fields and our own heaven. Arcadia to Harlock is a philosophical ideal. This is they just made it very real when he says Arcadia and they show a hilly, grassy landscape. So I'm thinking this is a place, but but you're saying that him saying Arcadia and that that drawing is a, a drawing of a, sort of a philosophical idea rather than an actual place. Well, hypothesis. OK, I believe it represents more than one thing to to Harlock and to Matsumoto. To the Harlock that we see in the World War Two section of Arcadia of my youth represents both the Germanic estate on which he was raised and the potential Arcadia to which he will hopefully go if he and when he does die. As if the, the green fields of his youth and the green fields of his eternity will be in some respects one and the same. So, so sort of the, the soldier living that life where he gets to say, I'm going to return to Arcadia no matter what happens. One way or another, I'll either be in this plane's Arcadia or a sort of philosophical idea that wherever he goes when he dies and enters the, the Toki no Wa. Um, so did you complete your thought on the scar? I think so. Yeah, okay. Um, the only other thing that I was thinking was with the eye patch and, and the left and right side of your body kind of representing the the yin and yang of each person, the acting side and the masculine and the feminine side. And, and which side is which is escaping me at the moment. But from what I kind of speculate, my hypothesis is that the whatever side it's covering, it's his he's kind of lost his vision or a, a particular facet of, of human existence. He no longer is able to see things that way harsh because of his loss, because of his loss of his eye, because of the loss of his friend, because of the loss of his lover. He's, he's lost the ability to see that softer side. Does that hold any weight? I've never thought of it like that because both in the comic, the comic series, older comic series and in the animation that I watched, especially the television series, Harlock is a likable figure. He has his softer side. But you know, what you say has weight and it's something that I it's something I need to think about. You need you need to ask Matsumoto for me. <laughs> Be that thorn in his side for me. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, <laughs> so, so let's, do you have anything else on that or? Well, it certainly, it certainly made me think. Now, perhaps, perhaps I do have a, a bias towards the way I look at him because I like the tragic hero in no matter the way in which he represents himself, stern or yielding. 
I see him as approaching right. Take take his appearance in 999, uh, particularly the movie version. After Tetsudo has been booted out of the bar, lost his pistol, he runs into the captain and the captain responds in a, I'd say a, I'd say a, a soft fatherly way by force feeding that damn robot a bottle of milk. That certainly got a sense of fun and certainly a sense of, what's the word? Parochial charm to it. But on the end of that comes his appearance at the Battle of La Mette, and he spares no efforts in wrecking the planet alongside Emeraldus and Metal Assault from within. So his softer side, his velvet glove, is wrapped over his mailed fist. He is a figure of contrast, not to be taken too lightly, but not entirely be taken too seriously either. No, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it represents a total loss of his duality. I think it's a, it's a specific aspect, and, and that being sight. The, the difficulty in seeing from that perspective, uh, acting from that perspective may be, may be different. But, but when we think of sight, I mean, what does sight represent anthropologically? Uh, hopefully that's a word uh, to you and, and to others in your field. I mean, when we think of sight, what do we think of? It's especially that eye that, you know, the left and right eye. What, what are the differences? What do you think? No, you make a very good point. A number of different cultures use the eye not just as a representation of vision, but a representation of wisdom. Egyptian, of course, and Sumerian are the classic examples. But even in Japan, the notion of the sun and the eye are directly connected. To lose a physical eye is to lose insight across multiple planes, especially here. Now, maybe there's there's something to be said for this. And if you think about how Harlock acts, and Emeraldus herself, how they act is often predicated by the actions of others, as if, in some respects, they are ignorant to things until they are brought to a sense of understanding. Maybe there is some, something in that. It certainly makes sense, and it's certainly an appealing point of view. I think you've got something there. Well, I appreciate you for validating me today. Uh, that'll be, that's it for, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and by the way, everybody commenting, thank you so much. We are going to get to your comments. Uh, uh, Harlock didn't lose his friend. I don't know if he sees it that way. I think uh, Harlock does feel like he lost his friend because he appreciates the flesh. He, he, he needs that sort of, uh, he, he, he still misses it doesn't stop missing his friend all throughout the, that manga. I mean, does that seem like uh, the stance Harlock has to you as well? To me, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that Harlock seems to know that after, after the great transition, uh, assuming we're referring to the 999 arc in which Tochiro bonds with the Arcadian computer. Mm -hmm. SSX Harlock as well. Harlock recognizes the loss and what remains after it, but he can no longer share a drink with his friend. He can no longer gain his advice. He can no longer see him sitting before the weapons console. There are enough panels and enough points that reference that sense of loss. I mean, Totoro, not to make a bad pun, but he's an animated character. He's a very, he's that boisterous little thing running, bouncing around full of energy and, and brilliance. It's, you don't have that same personal relationship with your central computer. And also for us, don't forget that with Harlock being in his own series, the main character and we, the point of view character, once Tochido has gone for Harlock, he has gone for us as well. And I too miss him. Yeah, and, and it's not like a Goku death. You know, Goku dies a bunch of times, but at the end, you're desensitized to it. Every time Totoro dies, it feels the same. 
it's always the same sense of loss. And and when you see him and he's, you know, when you get to communicate him, you uh, communicate with him after his death. You, I feel the the wall. I feel the emotional barrier that there is to be unable to make a full connection with him, even when he appears to be flesh and blood at the uh, end of Endless Odyssey. There's still a gap. It's felt. I think Rin Tadok gave us the best interpretation of that. Uh, best is perhaps a very subjective term. Sure. Let's say the one I like the most. And that was the 999 Tochiro's death. The first time Tetsuro shows up with Toshido's old hat, wearing his duster, carrying his pistol, and all the old figure can do is to say, well, you're here. It's now time for me to die. And passes through that great condenser, not only alerting his old friend to the fact that he'll never see him again, but to Emeraldus that she's lost the only person she's ever loved as well. That tears at us, even if we know he remains. We're we're talking about uh, the sort of iconography here, and we're starting to talk about different characters. Um, let, let's just cover the big three. Uh, let, let's move on to Tochiro. Here we have a squat man. He's got poor vision. Um, he's got he's very cloaked and hidden. Somewhat uh, recluse, but also full of tenacity. I mean, where's the iconography there? If we overlook, well, let's, let's not overlook. Let's take the self-insert, because mm -hmm. like Mirai Zaban, like Otko Oidon, Tochiro is my Galaxy Express. Self -insert. That's him Sorry. in the flesh. Yes, yeah. But beyond that, the great duster, the great hat, it represents a different type of fighter, the Old West coming back. That sense of freedom of individuality in a, a world which never really existed, despite the fact that two generations of pulp writers and filmmakers have painted the Wild West as if it was some sort of new world version of the medieval age. Tochiro is more than an engineer though in, that in itself represents a sense of intellect and intellectual freedom. But his Cosmo Dragoon, his duster, his, his hat, represent him being a, a figure on the frontier, a wild, uncontrolled individual who has no place in common society, but is willing to make common cause with people who will not misabuse him because of his unconventional looks, unconventional drinking habits, and unconventional way of thinking. And right. his, uh, in some ways, he has a more difficult time defending himself. Uh, in Gun Frontier, where these characters originate, he's a bad shot. He's not a good shot. He's got he's a master with the blade, but the new world degrades his uh, skills with the blade. However, well, he can carry himself in, in that at that present time. He's sort of doomed in a certain sense. He's doomed to irrelevancy. I mean, could you speak on that? I think. I think that's that's a series which represents a bit of an inversion. Harlock, of course, then is the, the conventional character. And in Matsumoto's mind, as far as I'm aware, his fascination for transitions, especially in this case, the Meiji transition, gave us a wonderful fish out of water character in Tochido, in that he goes from this samurai figure at the beginning to a fully realized protagonist by the end. But once again, like all of the characters, learning from the people around him, adopting, adapting, and joining with. Gun Frontier, it technically is a Lady Burst series now. I see it as a, a starting point, even if it was written post hoc in some respects. 
It's a lovely little thing. It also seems I, I'm just thinking now. It, it's kind of uh, it, it's kind of a metaphor, perhaps, for Japan and its relationship to the West and how it was changing. Um, you know, if you can imagine Totoro as Japan and the Wild West as this sort of modernized Europe, uh, Eurocentric world that it was joining. Uh, after World War II. I mean, does that hold any weight? I think not just the World War II uh, epoch, but also the Meiji. In both cases, Japan had to get good or get got. Meiji Japan improved to avoid colonization, the same horror that had been brought on China at the time. And again, post-World War II, America needed Japan to be a bastion against other forces, and Japan had to modernize quickly. But, and oh, go ahead. As every culture does, whether it's open or more covert, we do adopt and adapt cultures external to our own to make ourselves stronger and better to, fa you know, to better face the future. But there is something built into the way in which I think Japan has always faced that. One of the jokes I tell in my intro to Anthro or Japanese society class is that there is precious little in Japan, which is actually Japanese. The language isn't. None of the food is. The laws aren't. The imperial family isn't. But does it make them any less Japanese? Of course not. Doesn't matter that ramen comes from China or that the royal family came from Korea. It doesn't matter that the language is an amalgamation of different, possibly Altaic, possibly Polynesian, possibly East Asian things. They are now Japanese. And the same thing applies to any country around the world. But there is something we think of as pe peculiarly Japanese when we think of. Well, I don't want to say cultural adoption because that carries its own baggage with it. Cultural adaptation, perhaps? I mean, I would say, I know you want to dance around the word. I will flat out say that Japan culturally appropriates mm -hmm. and they, they've done it the best of any of any country, I think, in the world. They 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 adapted everything to, to suit their their needs and made it unique to their own culture. I, I don't think that's a problem. Uh, I will flat out say I don't believe that's a problem because it's how humans live as an anthropologist. There is a difference between appropriation for negative and for neutral. It's a hot button topic politically You're speaking right. these days, but how can we appropriate as humans when it's something we've done since we first stood upright as hominids? Yeah, all, all things will be done for uh, maleficent and pure purposes, and and appropriation is is not above that, uh, and it's all on a spectrum as well. But but not to get too deep into anything too political. But uh, well, I'm going to ask. Uh, this is this may be political. Totoro is looking for his sister in Gun Frontier, and here's maybe where we can get to the frontier of uh, anthropolog anthropological speculation. Um, what does the sister represent? I mean, this is, if Totoro is the embodiment of Japan, if, if the Wild West is kind of the embodiment of that Eurocentric world, and, and he's seeing family members, close, close friends, turning sides, going the other way, betraying, uh, he's seeing them being murdered and harmed, but a sister is missing. What does the sister represent? Okay, I want to, my idea, only my idea, just a sure. straight up hypothesis. We're on the frontier here. We're, it's all speculation. I'm going to have to say that Tochiro, to me, does not represent Japan. Okay. But it's individuals, the youngsters going into the new world, as it were. Those members of the post-major revolution who now have to deal with the very real facts. And his sister, 
represents the potential for past and future. She is another side of Japan that is being potentially used, abused, or changed. Her recovery, her rescue, her return home or whatever, and what happens to her during the story will ultimately reflect on what happens to Japan. Now, this comes from a very interesting source for Matsumoto himself, and that's the film Rashomon, in which the, the, uh, the samurai represents old Japan, the bandit represents foreign elements, in this case, perhaps most likely, well, most likely the Americans coming into Japan after World War II, and the wife represents the spirit of Japan itself. So for me, his sister represents a potential for Japan's future, as well as a representation of her past. And Tochiro, one of those rebels, however clumsy they may be, who took up cudgels on behalf of Emperor Meiji and brought the country into the modern age and then had to deal with that fact. Absolutely. Um, and I don't want to... Unfortunately, I feel like we're going to have to give Emeraldus less time here um, if we're only on for another half an hour. But uh, Emeraldus, I, I don't know where to start speculating. I've got ideas about the boys, but not the girl. Um, lead me. What, what do you think? Time and again, fans ask about her at the various fan meetings, and I did likewise. At first, there, was the, there is the assumption that she is just a female harlock. That's not the case. Even though she still has the scar, she wears a similar uniform, she flies her own ship. Are, in the, are they on the same sides of the face or no? I can't remember right now. It, hers runs down from nose onto her left cheek. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Dar Darren's got to go look at some reference material right now to ensure. Yeah, because because it's not something we're always thinking about. Yeah, she's back there, left cheek. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, well, what, what kind of icon iconography does she Beyond being just a girl, obviously. You know, that's a hard one for me. Yeah. She's mysterious, isn't she? I mean, it's so... Maybe she's a mystery in and of... You know, maybe she's a representation of mystery in and of itself. She's not the Sphinx, you know. You know, <laughs> terribly mysterious. The only, the only direct answer I've had from Matsumoto about Emeraldus is that he wanted a character that could approach and address questions that Harlock couldn't. Now, whether he meant from a female point of view or whether he meant from the point of view of just a and other person, I don't know. After all, at the time he created her, there, was, there wasn't even the twinkling in his eye that she and Meto would be sisters. You could argue the DNA was there, but it hadn't yet occurred to him. So she was just another space trader or pirate. And there is, of course, the, the ever-present idea that she is a fan service version of Harlock. I don't like that particularly, but I do admit that, he, that she does have a lot of fans. It, it's, it's all possible, and, and both could be true. You know, it, it's, And he understands the value of, uh, of a strong female character from his shoujo background. So he never... Uh, Simply fan service, I don't think could ever cut it. I, I, I really don't think so. I think he's, he's too deep for that. Um, perhaps maybe giving, uh, maybe though restoring some of that female or, or feminine intuition insight that Harlock's lost from the, his hardships. Now that, maybe he's grounded. That's interesting because she, she originally, or the concept sketch I saw for her had an eye patch. And as you will know, of course, in the series, she does not. She loses much herself, whether we, whether we mean her original comic incarnation, her TV incarnation, or more, more tightly the, 
the version of Emeraldus that shares Harlock in either the Arcadian timeline or the Galaxy Express timeline. She is a figure who has undergone oppression and risen from it, even more so than Harlock himself, especially in the later Galaxy Express timeline in which she and Metal have to orchestrate the downfall of their own mother. And I like that particularly, even though it is, it's not the classic Emeraldus, because the two sisters represent two very different parts of their own mother, which together become this tyrannical figure and apart become the, the rebel who re absolutely rejects mechanization and the rebel who undergoes it in order to bring the system down. Yeah, I mean, you've got uh, the active Emeraldus and you've got the passive Maytel. I mean, Maytel's not a completely passive character, but she rides the rails. She's she's a bit of a vagabond in some ways. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd have to take a little bit of an exception with that. A royal vagabond, in my opinion. Yeah, go, go on. I'd not say passive. I would say... Actually, it is. There is maybe like a better word. She's flowing, you know, she goes with the flow instead of resisting it constantly. She's I think she's far from passive. I think she's she she and her father, Dr. Ban, have a plan, but it takes a long time to put into place. I'd say perhaps morally ambiguous, because her part of the plan involves bringing like minded people such as Tetsudo into La Metal to build weak points into the whole planet system that once the right trigger can be found, the whole place will fall apart as it does. She's- And the right person to pull that trigger. Oh yeah. It's almost as if, yeah, they know, but that, but that plays into passivity because Maytel can't pull the trigger herself. Hmm. Even when that's kind of the plan, it's, it's she needs oh. the young boy. Okay, okay, stand corrected there, because if you look at the conversation she has with her father in the locket, it is clear that she's not particularly convinced of the plan at some point, doesn't like it, certainly doesn't like the fact that she has been remade in the image. Hold on a second, I've lost me here. I've lost me earphones, can you still hear me? I can hear you. Uh, the, echo, you the echo may ramp up, so I've lost my connection. Okay. So she, she doesn't, doesn't want like to pull fact, that trigger. She doesn't like the fact that she has been remade in the image of Tetsudo's mother. Doesn't like the fact that she is being used throughout the, throughout the series and in the end cannot bring herself to pull the trigger, as you say. It's a good way of putting it. It's 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 very interesting to dive into these characters and and we could dive into every single one and just talk about this for another two hours. And maybe we should do that someday uh, if you'll if you'll bless us with your presence again in the future. Oh, um, from Sheffield, you don't bless me. <laughs> but <laughs> well, what, we'll what about a round table? That would also be that would also be really, really fantastic. Great idea. We'll 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 spitball later on this. Um, yes. Excellent. Um, but we also want to talk about fans today. And I think we hinted at it that Matsumoto fans have what I've identified, and it seems like you identify it as well, a disproportionate impact on the Liegeverse, uh, more so to me than what I see with many other series. Can you elaborate on that? I think it is simply because Matsumoto Sensei is open open to ideas, open to concepts, and open to the fact that as a creator, he is bound to his audience. Now, this is, I don't want to cheapen, cheapen this by saying this is a, a transactional relationship and it com the bottom line completely drives his art. But if he gets a good idea from a meeting, yeah, you're going to believe he's going to use it. And the more his fans, especially here, believe that 
he's willing to listen. And somewhere down the line, they might find their work, their ideas in his series or their own work if they are artistic or creative. He's a great facilitator. Talk to Tim, if you like, about all the people he inspired to join, not just the Yamato projects, but things thereafter. Yeah, and uh, for anybody watching, feel free to go back and check out that interview with Tim. It's it's a great, uh, it's one of our briefest interviews, but I also feel like we just crammed in so much good information. I mean, great insight. And, and you're absolutely right. He is very open. It almost makes me wonder, you know, if we speculate too much on this, uh, on, say, the iconography of, of Harlock, maybe we'll end up seeing it. <laughs> seeing it in the future more prominently displayed maybe he's got ears to, to all that sort of fandom and, and important to him i've got to plug cosmo dna here uh, it's 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 tim's baby and it has been his passion project for years but it is a good place to go for anything yamato related tim eldred has forgotten more about japanese animation than we will ever know <laughs> That that's likely true, and uh, you can check him out on our Star Blazers. And uh, he just launched TimEldred.com, where he shows off all of his artistic work. So yes, please go check that out. Um, so so really, it's just you feel it's his openness that that makes this fan interaction so 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 prevalent. Beigeverse, yeah. He never he never approves trash. He doesn't flood markets with with odd merch it takes a great deal to get past him and his gatekeepers when it comes to putting projects up but at the same time he takes a hand in almost everything even after his stroke he's not as open to people now not just because of current year but those fan clubs that still exist yeah they can still write uh, the what's the his studio's address is still open. You can walk straight in. You'll probably get thrown out again. So but, why would you say he's less open to to contact now? Just because of his health, mostly, or age, I, I, age, the stroke, and COVID nineteen. He's been on he's been on lockdown since. Yeah. So physically, he's not as accessible. But right, he can. I feel if there wasn't. A pandemic, he'd be out and about. He he would have gotten out as soon as he got an okay for a doctor to get on a plane. Or something. oh yeah, yeah. Well, think about 2019. You wouldn't have you wouldn't have thought that a man in his 80s would be happy to jump on a plane and go to Italy for a couple of days. But he yeah, let alone draw in front of everybody. Yeah. Look at his Twitter. Look at his videos. Look at his daily post under his Mikon Twitter handle. Beiji Shah. Yeah. He still he still creates art. He still supervises the manga, even though he doesn't draw it anymore. He's still churning out ideas left, right, and center for potential projects. He's still supervising his few disciples. He loves his life, and he loves his work, and he loves his fans and family. And that love is evident. It's it's absolutely evident. And I'm I'm lucky to just get to share some of it because. I get to sort of get his praise sometimes. Anytime anybody says something nice about the page, it's just them saying ni something nice about Matsumoto. It's and I'm lucky to just get a, a grazing of that appreciation. So it's it's really wonderful what he's done. Um, I'm sure you've experienced some of that yourself. Yeah, he, a, a kind word from him is worth a great deal because it means so much. But an honest, um, an honest word is perhaps better. And he's given <laughs> me plenty of those, not all of them kind. Well, you know, <laughs> at least you respect it. You know, it's one thing to be to be told no by somebody you don't respect, by somebody you do respect. It's it, it hits different, as the kids say these days. A Matsumoto correction makes for a wiser action thereafter. Um I, I would agree. I, I feel wiser just having gotten to experience his works. Um, so 
What would you say is the most interesting thing you know about Leiji Matsumoto or his work? That's a uh, that is a hard Call order. Just just a, just a factoid, or or a philosophical point. Wow! Uh, <laughs> if give you, me the one you you want to say. Give me the one you want to say the most. The one that came to mind is the fact that just after the war, and possibly in violation of a number of laws, he came into possession of a complete set of the blueprints for imp uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy ship Yamato. I mean, complete blueprint, yes. full interior which he has recycled again and again and again throughout not only the show of the same name, but his own works. Now, that's the factoid. He had the blueprints to Japan's greatest battleship. But from a philosophical point of view, the most interesting thing is the fact that he always inserts himself into his works as the most inferior character. Then there's a reason for it. He does not want, he likes the joke, as it were, of injecting himself into his works. But he doesn't want his audience to think of him, think of himself as aggrandizing his own contributions. He's a bumbling little fool, and that's how he represents himself. But this oh super God. intelligent. Oh no, doorman. <laughs> it's okay. The doorman's here for Darren. Um, I'm just gonna wax a little bit here. It's it's interesting that he's saying that. Uh, you know, they, they he they're the most physically docile character in the series, and you know that that being Totoro, that being Tetsuro, <laughs> uh, but but it's always of a great intellect. Um, hey, delivery. What did I get? What's for, is it for me? It's the Arcadia. <laughs> is it the Shogakin? It's the new, uh, yeah, the new blue Arcadia Bandai. Oh, wow. Or should I say a second-hand version, because Mandarak is always cheaper. Well, yeah, it's pricey. Uh, would you share that with us at the end? Would you op Would you do an opening for us live? No pressure, no pressure. It, it's fine if you can't do it. Just share a picture if you can't do it, okay? Will you take a picture for us? Well, I've got one already. I've got, I've got one already on display, and this one is going off to someone else. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I, I, I can drag the other one down. Oh, uh, well, that, that's okay, that's okay. No, no worries, no worries. I'm glad you're, you're spreading the love. Um, let, let's keep it moving here, though. Uh, you know, it's interesting you say he's always the most... Uh, diminutive character i would say physically that's true but intellectually he's often one of the most powerful characters uh totoro being extremely wise uh the character in mirazer bond gaining every bit of knowledge from his family's past um tetsuro i think even gets something to that he scooped up in the comics from and i i didn't get to delve in as much into that but uh, yeah, I mean, any thoughts on on that? It, does he see himself as super smart? It sounds like he does. That's that's what he's been gifted with some insight that others haven't, and and I'd buy into that. Ooh, uh, it's not my place to say how Matsumoto sees himself. Not me. <laughs> you got to deal with him personally. I don't, so I understand. <laughs> uh, I'll speculate for you. Um, However, I. Since we know, since we can say that the Tochido family tends to be one of the sensei's self inserts, those characters, everyone from the uh, the Doctor aboard the Yamato, which is about as close to a Matsumoto character in that series as you'll get, right through to the current generation, they are characters of variation they are wise they are drunkards they are foolish they are friendly they are if not if not character analogs for ourselves point of view characters they are perhaps the the wise character the the sage that the 
hero meets, befriends, and gains from as they go on their journey. And if we turn it onto oh, Joseph Campbell's old ideal, which in fact Matsumoto still loves, the the Tochido insert or the the tet, um, the Edai insert or the Midizer Ban insert does make a good analog for the sage. And you know, I I if he sees himself as a sage, I'm not arguing. So that's that's fine with me if he does. I don't see it as self-aggrandizing to know your role in the world. Uh that's just to me is self-awareness. Um but yeah, let let's uh I mean, unless you have anything else to expand on there. I'm going to stop there before I dig myself a bigger hole. Sounds good. And, and direct all of his complaints to me. I'd love to have Matsumoto. Oh, my God. If he told me I was wrong about something, that, that would make my day. Just write. Um, just, just write. Today, Jisha. Do it. I've wrote, I wrote him on the website. I never got anything back. It's actually really difficult for somebody who doesn't speak Japanese to write him from the website. Then get someone you know who does know Japanese. <laughs> I've got an in. You can send it in I've Japanese. Got an in. Like Muppet. I've got an in. There we go. Okay, so we've all got an access point here. You guys access me. I'll talk to Darren. He'll talk to. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I said, I am a, I am, I'm the flea on his ear for a reason. Mm -hmm. I think he sees me as a pest. <laughs> well, even Inuyasha needed his pest. Uh, so. Let's uh, let's talk about we, we got like 10 minutes here, so I'm going to try and wrap up everything in like five minutes for our questions and then five minutes for uh, what everybody send the comments. And please uh, list your comments, list your questions in the comments, and I will do my best to get to them. And maybe even Darren can uh, take a look at them afterwards if he gets a chance. Uh, just know people are talking to you down there. Um, so for you, what is the, in, in like two minutes, what's the legacy of Matsumoto? It's yet to be written. They had yeah. two seconds. Speculate. Hopefully, hopefully yeah. it will be one of adventure and speculation. No matter whether it's the early works that looked at the potential for what might follow post-life in Mario Silver Valley and or whether it is the transhuman identity or whether it is just the common human sense of idealism which follows through all his main space opera works. I hope his legacy is one of adventure and of hope. I agree. Um... For you personally, Darren, what Matsumoto character, which Liege verse character are you? No doubt. Yatara. Yeah. Why why would that be? What do you think? Chubby, mostly harmless. <laughs> Bold. Do you not want to do things unless they really matter to you? I don't have enough time to really do things that don't matter. And I'm Going, None of us do. going through the academic world, I I became tired a long, long, long ago of doing things that matter to other people. But that's and perhaps I, I got this because an anthropologist's work is based primarily on a relationship between different people. I discovered that I didn't really start understanding myself until I started to make an effort to understand other people. Um, kind of my, I guess this is my last question. I don't want it to be. Um, how has the Liegeverse changed your life? I mean, I think you've kind of touched on it there, but can you wax a little bit more? I, I wish I could say it was some grand, life-changing, single event. But as with all those other figures who have intersected with my life, be it parents or friends or family or workers, it's not 
so much the lady verse that has changed me. It's Matsumoto Sensei himself gave me a very distinct way of looking at Japan, at looking at people, and reflecting on the obliquities within my own character. I, I, you know, it's it's amazing that you've gotten to have that first person change. But I think what you described uh, could summarize a lot of people's experience with just the work itself. And, and it's just how it, it shows just how inner interweaved he is with that work. And when you're reading Captain Harlock, when you're reading or when you're watching Galaxy Express, you're reading and watching Matsumoto himself to a great degree. He is in his work and uh, that's extremely powerful. Um, do so, not be disabused by the fact that he often does not seem to be heavily involved with his own works. His hand is on everything, no matter how little he may seem to have touched it. Yeah, there's there's the physical hand and there's the metaphorical hand, and uh, I think he's mastered both. Uh, Let's let's switch it on over to the fans now. Uh, let's see what the people in the comments are talking about. Uh, can you suggest some places to visit in uh, Japan for Matsumoto fans? His hometown in Fukuoka for a start, Kurume, and Nedima in Tokyo. There are a number of statues and the Toy Animation Museum. Uh, his, well... The finest place, though, the place he likes the most is the Yamato Museum down towards Nagasaki, where they have a, a one-tenth scale model of the battleship itself. And coming soon, hopefully, a large scale model of space battleship Yamato to go in a sister hall nearby. Are we talking like moving Gundam size model? I think it's about 20. Well, 300 odd meters divided by 10, so 30 odd meters long. So it, 110 scale, so it's anime figure scale. <laughs> it's a big bugger, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, how would you say uh, luck played into Leiji Matsumoto's life? In, in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, he was lucky to survive the war, as he said himself. Absolutely. Firebombing. Yeah, you, you talked about that. Then lucky that his parents would approve of him going off to be a comic artist on his own in Tokyo. Lucky to meet with Osamu Tezuka right at the point when he needed a little bit of help to jump in, jump into the career. Lucky to meet his wife, although we don't know much about her. She is clearly one of the driving forces in his transformation in art style to the the wonderful elfin form that we have today. Wait, uh, I, real quick, um, you said you, we don't know much about her? Not really. She keeps herself to herself and she retired as an artist. Right. And married. You right. Can and I think Asuma Tezuka introduced him to his wife. Yes. She's a, a very talented artist in her own right, and she still draws personally to this day. But she made the choice that of the two, his career had more scope, though personally. Well, Helen and I talk about that a bit in our interview that we did, and, and she had some really great insight into that, which you may be echoing here. Well, personally, I, I think that she still continued and continues to influence him. Every time, every time I've been to Lady Show, she's always been there with the tea. But there's no subservience in the relationship. And it's amazing how much his developed art style mirrors her own art style. And if they work together, so be it. Um, any other lucky breaks? Past meaning Maki, I think, is where we left off. Um, yeah. Uh, Maki Sensei. After that, I think he was very fortunate to get tied up with Toy and fortunate to meet up with the Dintaro, who's been one of his great directorial collaborators. 
after that, I don't want to speculate. Sometimes I think he makes his own luck, if you know what I mean. Good and bad. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Well, there's, there is that. There is that. But I think you've nailed some pretty definitively out of his control circumstances that that led him to be able to make more of his own luck. Well, maybe that's an accurate way to put it. Um, cool. Uh, so, yes, uh, the syndication 65 episodes plays into 13 weeks, apparently. I was not aware of fun tidbit. Um Hardlock hadn't lost his friends. His friends are always with him. Well, his lover isn't always with him. Maya doesn't get to stick around in the form of computer. Go ahead and spitball if you if you had something on your mind. Um, said that Hardlock and his friends have become even closer than they were before. Now that they're inseparable, well. I don't know how separable they were before that death. I guess by the physical nature of their relationship, it maybe you had a little bit more uh, fragility to it. A lot of people making a lot of good comments. I'm just trying to get here. Uh, Uh, so Susamu, this is an interesting comment. Uh, Susamu in Super Submarine 99, which again is releasing on my birthday uh, via di discotech, uh, takes care of the old rifle. Yamato is better than Andromeda. Uh, therefore, the katana is often more relevant than the gun in Liegeverse. What do you think about that uh, distinction in iconography? The blade... You know, raw blades feature very rarely in the series, except in unusual forms. Now, it could be argued that Harlock's reliance on his gravity rifle or uh, gravity sword is a reflection of that. It can be used as a sword, it can be used as a rifle. Mm. There is, I wouldn't say a reliance on the antique, but a reliance on the well-worn, the trusted. And it's interesting to know it's it's kind of that merging of old and new that Totoro is seeking. He's seeking the ability to live in this world of the gun when all he has is the sword. And it seems Harlock's done that. He's combined the two. That's very interesting. Even the um, Cosmo Dragoons themselves, they are, you know, they are nothing more than cult pistols dressed up, but and but they become so much more than that. There is an awareness of the nicety that goes with antiquity in Matsumoto's artistic and philosophical style. Um, and, and I think we have one more question here. I hope I'm not taking too much more of your time. Uh, somebody said here, I remember reading that Matsumoto based his female characters off an old picture of his grandmother. Uh, do you know anything about that, Darren? There are there are three models for most of his female characters, but most specifically Merkel. There's a the, a photograph of his grandmother in black furs, standing by a train with a great boyar cap on. And so she is, in many respects the physical identity for a lot of his characters. But as far as general beauty is concerned, this it's connected to an, a Franco-German model and actress called Marianne Holt. If you get a if you search the if you search the net, you'll find pictures of her, but it is her face that becomes the model for more or less all of his characters post 1965. Now there is a picture of an of a a black and white picture of a Japanese woman that I believe is a relative of Matsumoto that is often referenced in when it comes to Matsumoto's female characters. Are you aware of that? I've seen a few. When when we acquired, sorry, when we inquired for family photos for use in the book, we asked specifically for something that would reference 
Matsumoto's grandmother, and he didn't have anything on hand that, though the family didn't have anything that we could use. So it may not be an accurate image. Okay. It's difficult. So, go, on, go on. No, I was just saying it's kind of contested then. We're, we've got the creator right there, and uh, it seems that, I mean, like you said, he's he rarely seems to give a definitive answer, and answers change. So it's left up to us, it seems, to figure it, it may, out. It may be a question of the photograph in question not being a relation of Matsumoto. But we do know that Matsumoto's grandmother was one of the inspirations. And that is something which is referenced not only by the master himself, but also his younger brother, Susumu. Well, that, that's all fantastic insight. I, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions here, so I won't take too much more of your time. I, I just wanted to ask you if you had any parting words for us here at Liegeverse. There are no parting words in the Liegeverse. <laughs> they rarely even come to conclusive ends. You know, may we all meet again when the paths of time turn around to the beginning. And uh, Nadi Tokinoa. And let's do that round table. And uh, Helen's getting me in touch with all the writers, kind of just maybe we can network here. And so y'all keep an eye out. We're going to do more of this. This has been so fantastic. Uh, I think this is where we're moving the interview format because these editing all these super long videos while I really like doing it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I've got the time for it now. So keep an eye out for more live streams. Let us know what you want to see. Let us know what you want to know about. Feel free to keep commenting on this video with your questions. Uh, Darren will be able to see them. And in the future, hopefully we'll get to address something. So uh, again, I'm Jacob Campbell from Liegeverse, facebook.com slash Liegeverse. Check out the page. And I, once again, please, if you have the uh, resources, go and order pre-order that book, uh, Liege Matsumoto, Essays on the Manga and Anime Legend. The link is in the description. And uh, what you can also do that Helen suggested, if you got a local library, if you're going to college right now, talk to those library staff and tell them that you want this book in there because it is a reliable, it is an academic source. I believe it is a valid academic source on somebody that's just so important to the league. Forget my chapter, forget my scratchings. <laughs> it, if for nothing else, it's, it's worth it for Matsumoto's own interview. I yes. see the first full interview in English. Exclusive content, right? Yeah. You're not going to read this anywhere else. This isn't on Cosmo DNA yet. So uh, go check it out. Thanks again, Darren. Appreciate it. And uh, I asked you for the Harlock salute. No, I'm not Harlock. You're on the Arcadia, Darren. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Never a chore. Thank you so much. Same to you. Uh, see you soon, Lazyverse. Bye.